Mohammed Hatta, Wikipedia article audio. Mohammed Hatta, 12 August 1902 March 14, 1980 was Indonesia's first vice president, later also serving as the country's prime minister. Known as the PROC Lamater, he and a number of Indonesians, including the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno, fought for the independence of Indonesia from the Dutch. Hatta was born in Fort de Kock, West Sumatra, Dutch East Indies. After his early education, he studied in Dutch schools in the Dutch East Indies and studied in the Netherlands from 1921 until 1932. Early Life Time in the Netherlands Independence Struggle Struggle against Dutch colonial rule Japanese occupation Proclamation of Independence Vice Presidency Election and first months in office National Revolution Intellectual pursuits and cooperatives Setting Indonesia's foreign policy doctrine Retirement from the Vice Presidency Post-Vice Presidency Impact of Retirement Government Critic Transition from Old Order to New Order New Order Death Publications Awards Miscellaneous Notes Mohammed Hatta is often remembered as Bung Hatta. Hatta was born in Fort de Kock on August 12, 1902 into a prominent and strongly Islamic family. His grandfather was a respected ulama in Batu Hampar, near Payakumbur. His father, Haji Mohammed Jamal, died when he was eight months old and he was left with his six sisters and his mother. As in the matrilineal society of Minangkabau tradition, he was then raised in his mother's family. His mother's family was wealthy, and Hatta was able to study Dutch as well as finishing Curran after school. He went to the Dutch language elementary school in Padong from 1913 to 1916 after he had finished Sikola Meleu in Bukitagai. When he was 13, he passed an exam that entitled him to enroll in the Dutch secondary school in Batavia. However his mother asked him to stay in Padong because he was still too young to go to the capital alone. Hatta then entered Junior Secondary School or MULO. During his spare time, he worked part-time in a post office. Normally, MULO students were not allowed to work, but he was able to work there because of the HBS exam qualification. Hatta was interested in football, he joined his school's football team and was made its chairman. He broadened his sphere of contacts by using his position. Hatta used to visit the office of the Sarakat Usaha, led by Tahir Mara Soetan. In the office, he read Dutch newspapers, particularly about political debates in the Volksrad of the Dutch East Indies. It was at the age of 16 that Hatta began to be interested in politics and national movements. He was chosen the treasurer of the branch of the Jong Sumatranan Bond, which was first established in Padong in 1918. In 1919, Hatta finally went to the HBS in Batavia. He completed his study with distinction in 1921, and was allowed to continue to study at the Rotterdam School of Commerce in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. He took economics as his major and earned a doctorandus degree in 1932. The degree entitled him to follow a doctorate program. He then continued to pursue the doctorate degree, and completed all requirements to be awarded it, but he never finished his thesis. Politics had taken over Hatta's life. 
in the Netherlands, Hadda joined the Indisk Vereniging. In 1922, the organization changed its name to Indonesisk Vereniging and later to its Indonesian translation, the Perhimponan Indonesia. Hadda was the treasurer, and then the chairman. On his inauguration, Hadda delivered a speech with the title of The Economic World Structure and the Conflict of Power, in which he supported the idea of Indonesian non-cooperation with the Dutch colonial government in order to gain its independence. The Perhimponan Indonesia then changed from being a student organization into a political organization and had an unequivocal demand for Indonesia's independence. It expressed its voice through the magazine called Indonesia Merdeka of which Hatta was the editor. To gain more support from other nations, Hatta attended congresses all over Europe, always as the chairman of the Indonesian delegation. In 1926, Hatta and Perhimponan Indonesia joined the International Democratic Congress for Peace in Mark Sang near Estomain de Beerville, France. In February 1927, Hatta went to Brussels to attend a congress held by the League Against Imperialism and Colonial Oppression. He met many other prominent nationalists there, including Jawaharlal Nehru from India, Mohammad Hafiz Ramadan Bey from Egypt and Lamine Senghor from Senegal. Later in the year, Hatta attended another congress held by the International Women's League for Peace and Freedom in Switzerland. On that occasion, Hatta delivered a speech with the title of Indonesia and her Independence Problem. By the middle of 1927, Perhimponan Indonesia's activities had alarmed the Dutch authorities. In June 1927, Dutch authorities raided the residence of the organization's leaders, searching through their rooms and putting Hatta and other four other Indonesian activists behind bars. After spending nearly six months in prison, they were taken to trial in The Hague. They were permitted to explain themselves during the hearing, and Hatta took to the opportunity to explain Indonesia's nationalist cause. He made a speech to the court explaining that Indonesia's interests were in conflict with those of the Dutch, and that was why they could not cooperate. Hatta advocated cooperation between Indonesia and the Netherlands, but only if Indonesia was independent and treated as an equal partner, not unequally because of its status as a colony. The speech became famous and it is known as the Indonesia Vrij or Free Indonesia speech. In 1929, Hatta and other Perhimponan Indonesia activists were released. In July 1932, Hatta made his way home to Indonesia. Hatta returned home to an Indonesia whose nationalist momentum had been slowed down by the arrest and imprisonment of Sukarno. By the time Hatta had returned, most of the members of Sukarno's PNI had joined the Indonesian party and more radical PNI members, together with the Dutch-educated Sutton Syarar had banded together to form the new PNI. Although the initials were the same, the PNI in this case stood for the Indonesian National Education, indicating that it would focus on Qatar training. In August 1932, after returning from the Netherlands, Hatta became the chairman of the new PNI. In December 1932, Sukarno was finally released from prison and the attention now turned to which party Sukarno would choose. Sukarno, who had wanted one united front to gain Indonesia's independence was uncertain, thinking that in choosing one over the other, he would encourage division. In this, he was criticized by Hatta, who was more pragmatic about differences, in this case the conflict between Pardindu's radical and mass party approach versus the new PNI's moderate and Qatar party approach. Sukarno insisted on negotiations to unify Pardindo and new PNI but after failing, chose to join Pardindo.
Between 1932 and 1933, Hata wrote articles on politics and economics for the new PNI's newspaper Dalit Rachyat. These articles were aimed at training new Khadars for Indonesia's leadership. Hata seemed to be extremely critical of Sukarno at this point in time. In August 1933, with Sukarno once again arrested and facing trial, he wrote an article called Sukarno is Arrested. This was followed by articles entitled The Tragedy of Sukarno and The Stance of a Leader. The Dutch colonial government gave Sukarno a harsh punishment, exiling him to end on the island of Flores in December 1933. With Sukarno in exile, the Dutch colonial government now turned their eyes to the new PNI and its leadership. In February 1934, they made their move and arrested its leaders from its Jakarta branch and its Bandung branch. For a year they were jailed at prisons in Sipanang and Glodok, with Hata spending his time in Glodok. During his time in prison, Hata wrote a book entitled The Economical Crisis and Capitalism. In January 1935, it was decided that Hata and his fellow new PNI leaders would be exiled to Bhuvandagoil in Papua. When Hata arrived there, he was told by the local authorities that he had two options. The first option was to work for the Dutch colonial government as a civil servant for 40 cents a day with the hope of returning from exile, and the second option was being in exile receiving food but having no hope of returning from exile. Hata commented if he had decided to take a job as a civil servant in Jakarta, he would have earned a lot of money and knowing that, there was no need to go to Bhuvandagoil to be paid cheaply. In saying this, Hata chose the second option. During his exile, Hata continued to write articles, this time for the newspaper Pemandangan. He earned enough money from that to make ends meet at Bhuvandagoil and to support his colleagues who had financial troubles. Hata also used his books to give his colleagues lessons on economics, history, and philosophy. Later on these lessons would be made into books entitled An Introduction on the Way to Knowledge and the Nature of Greek Thought. In January 1936, Hata and Syarar were transferred to Bandanera in Malyaku. There they joined more nationalists such as Iwa Kusume Sumantri and Dr. Sipto Mangung Kusumo. Hata and Syarar were given more freedom and were able to interact with the locals. Hata and Syarar also gave lessons to the local children, teaching them about politics and history. Hata adopted a local boy, De Alwai, as his son while living in Bandanera. Alwai would become a prominent Indonesian historian and diplomat. In February 1942, Hata and Syarar were transferred to Sukabamai in West Java. By 1942, World War II was well underway and the Empire of Japan was fulfilling its imperial ambitions in East Asia and Southeast Asia. In March 1942, they began landing in Indonesia. Like their counterpart in Europe, the Dutch colonial government crumbled in the face of the invaders and by March 9, 1942, surrendered. On March 22, 1942, Hata and Syarar were again transferred to Jakarta. In Jakarta, Hata met with Major General Harada, the interim head of government. Harada asked Hata to become an advisor for the occupational government. Hata accepted the job and then asked Harada if Japan was here to colonize Indonesia. Harada assured Hata that Japan would not do. In Hata's eyes, an acknowledgement of an Indonesian independence by Japan was extremely important. If Japan, with its ultranationalistic ideology was able to recognize Indonesia's independence, 
it would put more pressure on the Allies as representatives of democracy to do the same thing. In July 1942, Hatta was reunited with Sukarno who after Flores had been transferred to Sumatra before the Japanese arrived, and had also been asked for his services. Although they had left off on a bad note, Sukarno wanted to speak with Hatta before speaking with anyone else. In a secret meeting at Hatta's Jakarta home Sukarno, Hatta and Sharar agreed that Sharar would go underground to organize the revolutionary resistance while the other two would commence their cooperation with the Japanese occupier. Hatta and Sukarno now had the common goal of working with the Japanese and then trying to achieve independence from them. Together with Ki Hajar Duan Toro and Muhammad Ya Chairman, Kiai Haji Mas Mansur, Hata, and Sukarno formed a quadawarvarate of leaders tasked by the Japanese occupational government as their intermediary with the Indonesian people. Hata together with the other members of the quadawarvarate worked with much fervor under the Japanese government. They echoed Japanese propaganda and presented the Japanese empire as the protector, leader, and the light of Asia. At the same time however, Hatta continued to promote Indonesia's desire for independence. In a speech in December 1942, Hatta said that Indonesia had been freed from the Dutch colonial government, but if they were freed only to be colonized by another power, he would rather see Indonesia drown to the bottom of the ocean. On March 9, 1943, the Japanese occupational government approved the formation of the Center of People's Power with Hata and the other Quadawarvarat as the CO chairman of the association. Sukarno thought that this would be a way from which they could gain support for independence, instead the Japanese used this to their own cause and to start their Romusha regime in Indonesia. In November 1943, Hata and Sukarno's efforts in cooperating with the Japanese occupational government was recognized by Emperor Hirohito who decorated them with awards in Tokyo. As the tide of the war began to turn against the Japanese, the Japanese occupational government in Indonesia became desperate to maintain control. Putera was disbanded and replaced with Jawahokokai in March 1944. Although still chaired by Sukarno, the Indonesians had less freedom of movement than they had had in Putera. When defeat began looming on the horizon, Prime Minister Koiso announced in September 1944 that Japan would grant Indonesia its independence in the near future. From then on, momentum began to gather for the independence of Indonesia fueled by the nationalist sentiments of Indonesians and supported by sympathizers from Japan such as Rear Admiral Maeda. In Maeda's case, he even set up a discussion forum called the Free Indonesia Center and invited Hatta and Sukarno along to deliver lectures on nationalism. This was followed in April 1945, by the formation of the Investigating Committee for Preparatory Work for Independence which would meet over the next three months and would decide on things such as the constitution and which territories would be part of Indonesia. By August 1945, as Japan was on the eve of defeat, the administration finally approved Indonesian independence and formed the Preparatory Committee for Indonesian Independence to supervise it. On August 8, 1945, Hatta and Sukarno were summoned to Saigon, to meet with Marshal Teraki, the commander-in-chief of the Japanese forces in Southeast Asia. Teraki told Hatta and Sukarno that the PPKI would be formed on August 18 and that Indonesia would be independent with Japanese supervision. Hatta and Sukarno returned to Indonesia on August 14. In Hatta's case, Syarar was waiting for him with news of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Syarar told Hatta that they would have to encourage Sukarno to proclaim Indonesia's independence immediately, 
because in a couple of days the Japanese might not be there to provide supervision. Siarer told Hata not to worry about the Japanese authorities because the people would be on their side. Siarer and Hata then went to see Sukarno, with Siarer repeating his argument in front of Sukarno. Hata then spoke out, saying that he was worried the Allies would see them as Japanese collaborators. Sukarno shared this sentiment and Siarer left the meeting out of frustration. The next day, on August 15, 1945, Japan surrendered to the Allies. In Indonesia, the news was only a rumor and had not been confirmed. Hata and Sukarno went to the office of the Japanese occupational government in Jakarta, only to find it empty. Hata and Sukarno then went to Maida who confirmed that Japan had surrendered to the Allies. Hata and Sukarno seemed shocked that Japan had surrendered. During the afternoon, Hata and Sukarno were confronted by Indonesian youths who wanted independence to be proclaimed as soon as possible. A heated exchange followed, with Sukarno telling the youths to have more patience. Hata, who was aware of this and Sukarno's superiority in the exchange, sarcastically commented on the youth's inability to proclaim independence without Sukarno. On the morning of August 16, 1945, Indonesian youths kidnapped both Hata and Sukarno and took them to the town of Rengastenglok where they continued trying to force Hata and Sukarno to declare independence, but without success. In Jakarta, there was panic as the PPKI was due to start meeting that day and had planned to elect Sukarno as chairman and Hata as vice chairman. When knowledge of Hata and Sukarno's whereabouts became available and the Japanese surrender was confirmed, Akhmad Subartjo, a PPKI representative, went to Rengastenglok to break the news to Hata and Sukarno. That night, Hata and Sukarno returned to Jakarta where, at Maida's house, they worked on the proclamation of independence. Finally, on August 17, 1945, at Sukarno's residence, Indonesia's independence was finally proclaimed in a short statement on paper signed by both Sukarno and Hatta. On August 18, 1945, Hatta was selected as Indonesia's first vice president by the PPKI to accompany Sukarno, who had been elected as the nation's first president. Hata would make three important decisions in the Republic's early days. In October, Hata gave the Central National Committee of Indonesia legislative powers in addition to its advisory role to the President. In the same month, Hata also authorized the formation of political parties in Indonesia. The next month, in November, Hata also made the decision which took away the president's role as head of government and transferred it to a prime minister. Hata was able to make these crucial decisions because Sukarno was unable to attend the meetings in question, leaving Hata in charge. For his part, Sukarno did not seem to have a problem with Hata's decisions, at least not during the War of Independence. When the Dutch began sending their troops back to Indonesia, Hatta, together with Siarar and Sukarno, all agreed that a diplomatic solution should be worked out. This caused tensions with more radical elements within the government such as youth leaders Cheryl Saleh and Adam Malik. In January 1946, Hatta and Sukarno moved to Yogyakarta leaving Siarar to head negotiations in Jakarta. By the end of 1946, the diplomatic solution which Hatta and Sukarno had been looking for seemed to have been found. The Ling Gajati Agreement, signed in November 1946 called for Dutch recognition of the Republic of Indonesia. However, territorial recognition would only be over Java, Sumatra and Madura. In addition, 
this republic would be part of a United States of Indonesia with the Queen of the Netherlands acting as the head of state. However, before the agreement was finally ratified by the Dutch House of Representatives, some compromises were made without the consent of the republic. In turn, Indonesia refused to implement its part of the deal, resulting in the first police action in July 1947. During this time, Hatta was sent out of the country to look for support for Indonesia. One country that he went to was India, the homeland of his old friend, Nehru. Disguised as an airplane co-pilot, Hatta sneaked out of the country to ask for assistance. There he asked Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi for help. Nehru assured him that India would support Indonesia and would make the support known at international forums such as the United Nations. In December 1947, negotiations were held aboard USS Renville and an agreement was signed in January 1948. This agreement was more favourable towards the Dutch and called for the Republic to recognise the territories which the Dutch had taken during the first police action. The agreement caused outrage and caused Amir Sharifuddin to resign from his position as Prime Minister. To replace Sharifuddin, Sukarno appointed Hatta as Prime Minister and declared that the cabinet would be an emergency one and would be answerable to the president instead of the KNIP. Hatta also took on the position of Minister of Defence. As Prime Minister, Hatta had to make an unpopular decision. In August 1948, with the Republic struggling to pay its troops, Hatta was forced to demobilize some soldiers. In December 1948, the Dutch launched their second police action and focused their attack on Yogyakarta. Hatta and Sukarno, instead of running away to fight guerrilla warfare chose to remain in the city and were arrested. Sukarno transferred authority to the emergency government of the Republic of Indonesia before going into exile with all the other Republican leaders. Hatta was sent to Banka. Resistance continued under General Sudirman and TNI troops who fought a guerrilla war against the Dutch. In March, Sultan Hamengkubu 109 organized March 1st General Offensive, in which the city of Yajyaharta was held by Indonesian forces for six hours. This played an important role in causing international pressure to be put on the Netherlands. In May 1949, the Roem van Ruygen Agreement was signed and the Netherlands promised to return the leaders of the Republican government. In July 1949, Hatta and Sukarno made their return to Yogyakarta. In August 1949, Hatta headed a delegation to The Hague for a roundtable conference. In November 1949, the formation of the United States of Indonesia was finally agreed. It was to be a federation consisting of the Republic and 15 states which the Dutch had created during the National Revolution. The Queen of the Netherlands would continue to become the symbolic head of state while Sukarno and Hatta would continue as president and vice president. On December 27, 1949, the Dutch authorities finally recognized Indonesian sovereignty. Hatta continued on as the Prime Minister of the United States of Indonesia and presided over the transition of the federal state to the unitary state which was made official on August 17, 1950. Indonesia soon adopted a constitution which advocated parliamentary democracy and reduced the president to the role of a ceremonial head of state. That left Hatta with little to do as vice president, especially since his term as prime minister was not renewed. For his remaining time as vice president, Hatta was regularly invited to deliver lectures in universities. He also engaged in intellectual pursuits, writing essays and books about topics such as the economy and cooperatives. 
the idea of cooperatives being an integral part of economy would become a pet project for Hata and he would become an enthusiastic promoter of the idea. In July 1951, on the occasion of Cooperatives Day, Hata went on the radio to deliver a speech on cooperatives. In 1953, Hata's contribution towards promoting cooperatives was recognized and he was given the title Father of Indonesian Cooperatives at the Indonesian Cooperative Congress. Aside from cooperatives, Hata's other main contribution to Indonesia governance was the setting of the nation's foreign policy doctrine. In 1948, Hata delivered a speech called Rowing Between Two Rocks. In it, he referred to the Cold War and the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Hata said that Indonesian foreign policy has to look after its own interest first, not that of the U.S. and the USSR. In saying this, Hata wanted Indonesia to be independent in deciding its stance during the Cold War. Hata also added that Indonesia should be an active participant in world politics so that once again it would be Indonesia's interests that came first. This doctrine, which would become known as the Independent and Active Doctrine, continues to be the basis of Indonesian foreign policy. In 1955, Hatta announced that when the New People's Representative Council as well as the Constitutional Assembly, a body commissioned to create a new constitution, were formed as a result of the year's legislative and assembly elections, he would retire from the vice presidency. He announced this intention in a letter to Sukarno. On the surface, it seemed as if Hatta was retiring for practical reasons. Because the presidency was a ceremonial role, this made the office of vice president pointless, and Hata thought that the country was wasting a lot of money paying his wages. There were also personal reasons, however. As a man who believed in democracy, Hata was beginning to feel disillusioned with Sukarno's increasing autocracy and authoritarianism. Hata had continued to advise Sukarno against taking this road but he was ignored. Hata finally gave up and thought that he could no longer work with Sukarno. On December 1, 1956, Hata resigned from the vice presidency. Hata's retirement caused shockwaves all around Indonesia, especially for those of non-Javanese ethnicity. In the eyes of non-Javanese people, Hata was their main representative in a Javanese-dominated government. The impact of Hata's retirement was evident in the revolutionary government of the Republic of Indonesia Rebellion which wanted to break free from Indonesia, and the Universal Struggle Movement, which asked for decentralization. In negotiations with the central government, both PRRI and Permesta listed the reunification of the sukarno hata leadership as one of the concessions that they wanted from the central government. Now outside the government, Hata began to openly criticize Sukarno. One of his criticisms was Sukarno's lack of commitment towards national development. Hata said that the revolution ended with the Dutch recognition of Indonesian sovereignty and that the government's focus should be on development. Sukarno rejected this idea outright and responded to it during his 1959 Independence Day speech by saying that the revolution was not over. In 1960, Hata wrote a book called Our Democracy. In it, he criticized Sukarno's guided democracy as another form of dictatorship. Sukarno immediately banned the book. The same year Sharar's political party, the Socialist Party of Indonesia was banned and two years later he was imprisoned on conspiracy charges. Hata wrote a personal letter to Sukarno calling the arrest colonial and non-rational, but to no avail. The old revolutionary trinity had definitively broken down. 
During the tumultuous time which saw the presidency changed hands from Sukarno to General Suharto, Hata remained in the background. However, he would break his silence in June 1970, just a week before Sukarno died. In a letter to Suharto, Hata said that he was disappointed that Sukarno was put under house arrest instead of being put on trial. Hata's reason for this was not malicious, he just wanted matters relating to September 30th movement coup attempt of 1965 to be cleared up and for Sukarno to be given a chance to defend his actions, as many believed that he was not guilty. Hata's involvement with Suharto's government came at the beginning of 1970 when protests were made about corruption within it. In January 1970, Suharto appointed Hata, along with three others as members of a commission to investigate corruption within the government. The results of the commission's investigation was never revealed to public until they leaked in July 1970. It then became apparent that the suspicions of the protesters were correct, there was widespread corruption within the government. Controversially, however, in August 1970, Suharto disbanded the commission and allowed for only two cases of corruption to be looked at by the government. In July 1978, together with Abdul Harris Nasution, Hata set up the Institute for Constitutional Awareness Foundation, set up to act as a forum for critics of Suharto's regime. Suharto's government moved quickly and did not allow YLKB to conduct its first meeting in January 1979. The YLKB did not give up. In August 1979, it managed to hold a meeting which DPR members attended. Perhaps significantly, members of the Indonesian military also attended. During the meeting, Nasution criticized the new order for not fully implementing the Pancasila state ideology and the 1945 constitution. Hata died on March 14, 1980 in Jakarta and was buried in Jakarta's Tanakuzer Public Cemetery. He was declared a proclamation hero by the Suharto government in 1986.